Okay, so I think we'll get started and anyone joining will be able to catch up, hopefully. Uh, hi, welcome. I'm not sure whether to say good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> I think it's one minute past 12 now, so I'll say good afternoon. My name is Andrew Wilson. I work for the Supply Chain Sustainability School. I'm a programs manager. And one of my responsibilities is developing the activity and supporting the training that we provide in Scotland. It's a pleasure to welcome you today uh, to this webinar. Uh, delighted to introduce uh, Simon and Dan to talk about the role of the environmental clerk of works in the planning system. Uh, this particular session has been quite long in the making and we're delighted that it's now happening. Uh, it's clearly a issue of growing importance and there, as you will be aware, are new guidelines uh, for the environmental clerk of works, which both Simon and Dan are going to talk about through the webinar together. Uh, before I pass across to uh, both Simon and Dan, I'm going to just say a few words on behalf of the Supply Chain Sustainability School. Uh, I won't take too long in doing that. It's just to set the scene and provide a little bit of context. Uh, the school, for those of you who aren't aware, is a industry-led program, uh, which has been uh, evolving now for the last 12 years. Uh, we've got about 6,500 corporate members uh, across the UK, uh, about 700 of those are based in Scotland. And we're a programme, as I've said, which is led by industry and funded by industry to develop skills, understanding and competence on sustainability issues right through the built environment supply chains. So we work in facilities management, as well as housing, as well as infrastructure, as well as commercial construction. So the whole model is based on uh, tier one contractors, major manufacturers, client partners, funding uh, a resource uh, which is available free of charge for the supply chain to make use of. Uh, companies and individuals can access our material online, as well as attending training sessions such as this and face-to-face -face interventions that we also deliver. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to explore our website, please take the time and have a look at all of the free resources that we provide at supplychainschool.co.uk. Do an assessment if you uh, hopefully will find that useful on individual and corporate level to benchmark your existing knowledge. And uh, then that provides you with a bespoke learning plan, which you can follow uh, to develop your skills and your organization's capability on sustainability. Uh, so that's enough about us. I'm now going to pass across to the main aim of today's webinar. This is about conservation and compliance, and it's about the crucial role of the environmental clerk of works in the planning system. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Simon Knott uh, and Dan Arnold from the Association of Environmental Clerk of Works. Uh, Simon is a director of Naturally Compliant, and he's been putting a lot of effort in uh, to develop uh, this learning uh, experience for everyone today. Uh, so thanks, Simon, for, for doing that, first and foremost, and thanks also for joining us and sharing your knowledge. He will be uh, supported by Dan Arnold, who's a senior environmental advisor at Stravag, who also contributes as a committee member to the work of the Association of Environmental Clerk of Works. So Simon and Dan are going to talk us through uh, the importance of the role, the new guidance, which has now been published and uh, which is available for you all to uh, have access to, and how that uh, how it's important for uh, environmental clerk of works to uh, be engaged uh, by uh, project leads, project managers, and uh, the lead contractor and the supply chain in the very early stages to prevent any unnecessary delays and ensure environmental protection. So uh, that's enough for me. I'm now going to pass across to the experts, Simon and Dan, who will take it away from here. So Simon, thank you very much. Over to you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, it's rather disconcerting. I can only see our four shiny faces. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think as we go along, if there's any questions, uh, I'm not sure what the the process will be, I guess, into a chat box or um, 
something like that. Um, but then I think there's certainly time for, for questions at the end. So um yeah, we will we'll just see see how we go along. Um and once again, thank you very much to the the supply chain sustainability school and to Andrew and Lorraine for, for supporting us and getting us on on uh, today. As Andrew says, this has been a quite a long time in coming, um, certainly from our perspective um, and our engagement with the Heads of Planning Scotland um, and the the sector um, in, in it of, of itself. Um, so we're, we're delighted to be to be here um, and I'm presenting you to, to you today. Um, so as Andrew said, uh, my name is, is Simon Knott. I'm a, an ACAO uh, management committee member and director of, of Naturally Compliant. Um, Dan, do you want to just say hello? <clears throat> yeah, hi. Yeah, I'm also management committee member, um, but I'm also an uh, environmental advisor for Contractor um, up here in the Highlands of Scotland at the moment. So um, perhaps uh, looking at it from a, a, a different perspective as well. Brilliant. Um, and I suppose for those that, that aren't aware of, of ACAO or the Association of Environmental Clerk of Works, um, we are the, the representative body um, and the qualifying body for, for those providing the Environmental Clerk of Works service to, to the sector. Um, and we've been, well, we were formed over 15 years ago now, I think, um, and obviously doing a lot of work in in the in the area um, and trying to promote the the role of the environmental clerk of works and as you'll see a bit later on um trying to create a bit more consistency around what an environmental clerk of works is uh, and what they're they're seeking to achieve um so please do have a look at acow.org or um certainly if you're interested in this in this compliance space then um our, our environmental management in, in the construction sector and um, please do have a look at the, the the acow website um and there are if you if you want to support the the website or, or become involved in the uh, the organization rather um then there are um, different mechanisms behind that so we can have other there are affiliate memberships for those that potentially aren't practicing environmental clerk of works but um want to be kept in the loop and, and want to to influence the the sector in a, a positive way so obviously um we're talking the the heads of planning Scotland um, have, have released some guidance on on the the use of uh, yeah the the use of environmental clerk of works in in Scotland um, and how that fits into the planning system. So the heads of planning Scotland are uh, a, a representative organisation for senior planning officers from Scotland's local authorities, the national park authorities, and strategic development planning authorities. Um, and within hot, hops, uh, as we uh, we've taken to calling it, um, they also have quite a strong link with with Nature Scott and with with SEPA. And so, what we're going to be talking to you today about today is is obviously related to Scotland only um, and the planning system only. Um, so it is a, a planning system element, but it does have wider implications um, for. For the industry um, and certainly for developers and for um, for contractors um, and this this sort of piece that we that, that hops have published is is part of their remit in, in supporting and in promoting excellence and in, in planning leadership and continuous improvement and we'll touch on on that a bit later as well so that's that's hops and We've been engaged with with hops and the the wider regulators in Scotland for for many years, um. But we presented to hops in late twenty twenty, um, on the need for a consistent approach to the environmental clock works in the planning system, um, and behind that need or behind that that driver, um, were three principles, um, that we've that we've distilled things down to. And those principles relate to to shining a light on construction phase environmental performance, 
um, looking to reduce conflicts of interest for those providing um, the role, but also for for the role itself um, in terms of, of what it's seeking to achieve. And finally, to, to promote a consistent approach to, to the MFCAO role. And what we, we're looking to do today or through the rest of this presentation is just to to go through um, the why. Why have we chosen or why do we think that these things are, are important and, and why do the HOPs or what have HOPs done to, to implement um, processes and the guidance around each of these three points, um, the why, the what they're looking to do, and then, then finally um, what it means in practice. So in terms of shining a light on construction phase environmental performance, um, I, I'm not sure if, if anybody's aware, but the, the Office for Environmental Protection released the report um, in October or, or later to, to Parliament in October. And it identified several challenges within the current EIA system, uh, one of which is a, a lack of consistent and robust post-consent monitoring and the potential lack of understanding around actual environmental impacts. So within that report, um, they referenced a, uh, a study done in 2000 um, by, by Christopher Wood and, and colleagues looking at the auditing, the, the assessment of environmental impacts of planning projects. And rather worryingly, and this was in 2000, so um, this kind of, again, relates to the fact that there's a lack of data out there and we, we kind of just don't know what's happening in real terms as, a, as an industry um, of, of what things look like. So out of 865 predictions across 28 projects, um, and that is um, predictions of significance, only they found that only just over half were auditable. And of those, only 49% were found to be accurate. So within this planning structure that we have, the, the impact assessment process, um, there were 865 predictions, less, uh, just over half were found to be auditable and only half of those were found to be accurate. So um, that in itself is, is quite a worrying trend or, or set of information. Um, and as ACAL, um, it's quite, I suppose, we, we, we're working in the space and, and we've got anecdotal evidence. So this is from a, a wind farm environmental incident analysis in, undertaken in 2016. So over a 37 week period, there were 134 incidents by incidents from mean either a breach of planning condition or a, a breach of, of legislation, um, be it well, the CAR or the Wildlife Countryside Act or, or something like that. Um, and that kind of comes out at 3.62 incidents recorded per week. Um, and so just to round off, given the, un and this quote is taken directly from the OEP report, um, given the uncertainty we've found in predicting environmental impacts, there's a high risk that environmental harm is not off being offset as anticipated. So, that's kind of why we want to shine a light on construction phase environmental performance. We want to understand what the the actual impacts of this um, of the of, of our activities are, um, so we are not contributing to the to the biodiversity and, and climate crisis that that we're we're in at the moment. that's shining a light um the next obviously is to develop a process that removes conflict of interest and again this is from the oep report um and, and direct quotes from from within there um so within that report it says that the implementation and monitoring of mitigations are routinely left to developers and contractors with little or no oversight from regulators the end result is that many mitigation measures are, are not carried out or are deficient in their implementation. And similarly, developers normally mark their own homework by employing consultants to provide information to the LPA to demonstrate compliance. Um, so the process at the moment is, is kind of woolly and uh, 
I suppose it was kind of reinforced. I don't know if hopefully people saw the Panorama episode on, on Monday looking at, um, at water companies and and the relationship with the environment agency. Um, but within that that Panorama program, there was talking, there was a sort of the, an identification that self-regulation doesn't provide the the level of scrutiny required and, and potentially can be manipulated to to meet the reason i suppose the, the objectives of of the of, of people in in certain situations um so the way that things work at the moment um, and we'll touch on that in the next couple of slides is that um the we and, and i suppose linking to the previous slide we just as a as a, as a sector we don't really know what the impacts are um and people are less likely to to provide information um should it make them should it make them look bad so in terms of creating a consistent approach again this was was research undertaken back in 2017 i think where we looked at the the terminology that is in a, a planning condition um so of of the projects that we we found that had a planning planning condition they there was an ecal terminology um and that could be ecological clerk of works or environmental clerk of works or just a pure just ecologist that was specified as as the condition um so of those environmental or that ecal requirement in the the planning condition um 73 percent were were specified as being an ecological clerk of works uh 23 as an environmental clerk of works and and four percent as an ecologist however if you we then looked into the remit of that ecological clerk of works um and 61 percent of those were had a broader remit than just pure ecology um and i appreciate we've we've had this discussion previously on on, on other webinars and things and it and it's well what it's just a name it's just terminology it it, it doesn't really matter um but i suppose it, it depends on what your the role is trying to achieve so acow and now the hops paper define the, the environmental clerk of works role as a, an environmental construction professional with direct responsibility for monitoring compliance with environmental legislation policy or mitigation so basically the role is there to to monitor whether the project is is being developed in a in a compliant manner or not um so that's an environmental clerk of works uh, an ecological clerk of works as described by saim and their and their processes at the moment they've got an accredited ecological clerk of works um system on on the go um, and within that, that ecological clerk of works is somebody that advises on protecting valued biodiversity features on construction sites. They provide practical site specific and proportionate assistance on how they to and how their clients can achieve compliance with environmental legislation um, and manage ecological operatives engaged in ecological mitigation activities, such as undertaking ecological watching briefs. So the the ecological clerk of works role is is there to implement mitigation. The environmental clerk of works role is there to monitor whether that mitigation is being undertaken or not. Um, and unfortunately, given where we're at, the the roles often become um, combined into a, a hybrid role, which means that the Environmental clock of work, stroke ecological clock of works is providing advice, but also monitoring the the performance of the project, which then as we go back to um the conflict of interest element, um, you're effectively marking your own homework. So in terms of how the is delivering um with the, the shining a light on construction phase environmental performance 
this is a quote taken directly from the paper. Um, the environmental clerk work system allows the independent gathering of compliance data to inform the planning authority if the project is being built in accordance with environmental mitigation enhancement as approved and all the rest of it. Um, but more importantly, and be uploaded to the publicly available planning system as per normal discharge of planning conditions. So effectively, those reports, those environmental clerk of works reports will be available to to the to the public, but um, probably more likely um, to the to the regulators um, and to to interested parties, potentially even um, the consultants that wrote the the impact assessment um, to see if if what they had written into um, or their assumptions are. are founded in in um in the reality of the project so that's one of the big elements um from the paper in terms of how the paper diver or reduces conflict of interest um in terms of its pro procurement route so the and i know andrew mentioned this at the start but this really i suppose what we're getting to at this point is that contractors and developers certainly through the hops paper as a planning condition won't be engaging environmental clerk of works it's up to them up to the project team to to manage their environmental responsibilities um as they as they see fit um but where it comes to to environmental clerk of works they shall require a statement that the environmental clerk of works shall be engaged by the planning authority but funded by the developer um, and that means then that in terms of reporting, the env environmental clerk of works reports are sent to the planning authority, the consenting, uh, and any other consenting authority at the same time as the contractor and developer. So everybody's getting the, the same data at the same time. Um, and responsibilities, um, as I said, the, the environmental clerk of works is, is not responsible for delivering or ensuring compliance. Um, it's not empowered to issue instructions on site or design or implement mitigation or, or enhancement. And that the reason for that is so that there's, we're reducing the conflict of interest of the environmental clerk of works providing advice and then also reporting on that advice to the planning authority. With regards to creating a consistent approach to the environmental clerk of works role, um, we the the hops paper is is defined um as as we can see there um and in terms of addressing the inconsistency and in impact assessment um whilst sometimes referenced as part of the mitigation set out within an impact assessment report the environment clerk of works is monitoring and reporting only and is not involved in the design or implementation of any mitigation um and that in reality is um about taking some of the the bias that comes from the impact assessment um on the the environmental clerk of works role and what we would say to to consultants that are developing impact assessment is is to liaise with the, the developer to understand how the developer wants to manage their environmental obligations and and identify that in the um, in the impact assessment Um, and then again, just for consistency around the environmental clerk of works role um, within the paper, there's an establish or there's the, the paper establishes a threshold for environmental clerk of works requirement and also a suggested frequency of visit. So hopefully um, the environmental clerk of works will become more standardized in when a planning authority will ask for it um, and the the frequency of visit and therefore the the resource required for a project um, becomes more consistent in in the way that it's delivered um, and this is a an indicative organogram um, and again it just relates to the planning system it, it's not a, a an organogram that potentially outlines a, a contractual arrangement or how the project is being managed but it's really just to show that the environmental clerk of works sits outside of the influence of the the, the project um, and reports to the project 
Um, however, that's being managed to the developer and the planning authority all at the same time. And then the planning authority will engage with regulators um, as they as they see fit. So in terms of in practice and, and what that actually means um, and, and the benefits uh, and potential uh, the benefits of, of the, the role. In terms of shining a light, um, we're, we're looking at unconflicted un construction phase environmental compliance information. Um, so that could be used by the consenting body to understand whether the mitigation strategies that are identified an impact assessment and that the bottom piece there talks about a feedback loop back into impact assessment so is the mitigation strat or are the mitigation strategies that are being um written into uh, impact assessments are they practicable are they effective are they, do they work um or not and providing an evidence base for that um it could also be used um to support third party assessments so the considerate contractor scheme or the, the BRIAM infrastructure if, or SQL as it was. Um, so basically it just shows that how the project is performing um, and potentially where improvements can be made. Um, and, it, and it can also be used um, potentially in as part of the tendering process um, to support good environmental performance. So if, if you as a contractor um, are, are really managing your environmental obligations really well um, and being very proactive, then you can use that data because it's unconflicted um, as part of our, um, you'd be able to use that as evidence to show that you're a proactive environmental or proactive principal contractor um, or contractor. So there are lots of benefits around shining the light. So we can start to, to, to develop a, a process of continual improvement, um, but also looking at, at providing um, independent third party um, information as to uh, how a contractor performs. Um, in terms of conflict of, of removing conflict of interest, um, so the the environmental clerk of works that's commissioned to satisfy a, a planning condition or the planning condition with the that identifies the environmental clerk of works need and um, they're going to be engaged by the the consenting authority um and just to reiterate the way that this is is looking at working projects should manage their environmental obligations as they see fit so they should engage site-based environmental managers advisors technical specialists um such as the Syene described ecological clerk of works or project ecologist or, or whatever that particular role um, is called um, as required to deliver a compliant project. So ultimately the responsibility for environmental performance as it always should have been sits with the the, the developer and, and the project and team as a, as a whole. Um, and as I said before, the environmental clock of works will report to, to each party directly um, and simultaneously. And in terms of consistency and the way that we're looking to, or the, the HOPS paper is, is promoting um, consistency, it provides that consistent position of what an environmental clock of works is. Um, and more importantly, what it is not um, in relation to the planning system. So we've got this consistent role um, that, that's associated with the planning system and places responsibility for environmental performance back on the project team. Defines a, a threshold for environmental clerk of works condition and frequency of visit. Um, and there's also a, a model condition at the, the bottom of the HOPS paper. And in terms of, of next steps, um, which I'll touch on later, but um, the the various banks of model conditions that are, are in place at the moment, um, it's our understanding that this model condition will, will find its way into, into those such as the ECU um, and the um, 
the onshore wind agreement as well. So in, in summary, um, and just to make it hopefully super clear, um, developers and contractors um, should engage site-based construction phase environmental managers, advisors, um, technical specialists to manage their environmental obligations as required. Um, the environmental clock works role will provide unconflicted environmental performance data that will be available on the planning system. Um, so we, as a, a sector, we can understand where we, we can improve and where the, the potential risks are. Um, and the, the HOPS paper provides certainty and a consistent approach to the environmental clock of work role. Um, so as we go through this process and as um, as Rebecca Passmore, our, our chair of, of ACAL, um, will be presenting to, uh, I think it's over 100 um, of the LP, or LPAs um, or people working for, them, for the LPAs next Tuesday um, and as this rolls out there's a there's certainty around the the role um, and a consistency of approach um, and in terms of our next steps um, as I say we will continue to engage with with the supply chain sustainability school um, we're going to reach out to to seeker um, with whom we already have a pretty good relationship um, there's the HOPS and Improvement Services webinars, um, ACAL webinars, and the, the model conditions will be going into the ECU and, and the onshore wind sector deal. Um, but what we're also doing is is looking to engage with a, an independent body, um, probably a university, to validate the implementation of this, uh, just to see if it's successful as a policy position um, and, or rather a position statement um, and see if there's anything that we can do to improve that. And that is everything, um, I think. Um, Dan, do you want to just run through maybe um, just the, or the, your experiences of, of being a, a construction site based environmental yeah. <clears throat> professional yeah for sure so in, in the previous life i've i've undertaken the environmental clerk of works role um in different capacities and i think um the main the, the two key things are awareness and culture um so the awareness side of it is is actually understanding from an early stage when you bring people into projects what their their roles and responsibilities are there to do and you get this kind of blurred line gray um, understanding sometimes from an environmental capacity um, so the more work that can be done to to segregate roles um, it, it is only a good thing um, I think principal contractors in general are coming along uh, on that journey and there's been uh, a wholesale increase in awareness um, over the 10 or 15 years that I've been doing uh, on-site uh, environmental roles. Um, so yeah, I think it's only a good thing that, th that this role is um, is perhaps understood uh, from a from a range of viewpoints, not just in in the kind of contractual world and on-site world, but um, from an LPA point of view, um, transparency is always the best way. Um, but, and and the more transparency that there is in projects, um, the less things that, that can go wrong. And if they do go wrong, you know, there's an understanding of why. So, um, yeah, fully behind the kind of the, the trajectory we're going on. Um, and yeah, the, the more the more that can be done to, to increase that is the better. Um, yeah, that's probably as far as we'd like to Brilliant. go on that. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Yeah, just to reinforce that, um, as I say, when it relates to planning or the, the planning condition, um, we're looking to see, well, ultimately we're looking to see the projects manage it themselves and and the people that are ensuring works or ensuring mitigation and, and, and designing it 
uh, the environmental managers, the advisors, um, and their technical specialists. Whereas an environmental clerk of works is purely there to to monitor the the project's performance. Um, and uh, achieving that clarity again makes it a lot easier for for those providing the environmental clerk of works role. Um, on a personal level and, and then also on a professional level as well, just creating that consistency. Um, so Lorraine, Andrew, I, I'm not sure, can we, are we, we've got five questions. I'm okay, sorry about the delay. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, uh, let's use the time that remains to ask questions and, uh, go over any information that wasn't clear or uh, use Simon and Dan as a resource to uh, share views and uh, seek some clarification. So I'm very happy to to do that. Thanks on behalf of people who've joined first and foremost for Simon and, and Dan for, for your presentations. Uh, it's been very clear from our point of view uh, and hopefully it's uh, been uh, some very useful information for, for those that joined. So yeah, happy to uh, pass across to the audience uh, if you'd like to put any questions into the chat or uh yeah we can uh, I, I can moderate in that way Lorraine was there anything that you wanted to add uh in terms of sending out resources we're recording the session aren't we so we'll be able to send out a link to that recording and the pdf versions of Dan and Simon's slides to those that have joined all the recordings, the recording link will be available next week and that will go to everyone who's registered and participated uh, today, um, as well as some other recordings for other sessions we've done around Scotland this year as well. And the slides, slides will be available too. Is there anything else that the school can do? You obviously referenced ourselves on one of your final slides there in terms of, you know, engaging with the industry. Uh, Besides this session, are there other resources that we should be sharing, that we should be promoting and, uh, you know, getting more pairs of eyes to uh, to view? Yeah, um, I think as we we're, we're working very closely with IEMA at the moment, um, developing a, um, a, a couple of documents around communicator mitigation um, and also CEMPs um, and how we communicate commitments that were in impact assessment in a more effective way um into and in so we can achieve that in in construction and within that document um there's a, a roles and responsibilities schedule um from a that's that's drawn from a number of professional bodies um and so once that's released probably in q1 potentially q2 next year um we'll send that on to yourselves as a, a bit of resource just in terms of guidance around obviously what's been written into impact assessment how to to best get the information from that um from that impact assessment and then roles and responsibilities um okay. as well yeah thanks we'd be happy to share that and host it you know within our resource library and particularly uh, shine a light on that for the scottish partners and the scottish members that uh, we communicate with quite quite regularly. Well, that that piece is is UK wide, but yeah, but for sure, um, yeah, share it as as you see fit, um, and then yeah, just the the ongoing um, pieces. I think there's there's a number of of elements that we we're, we're going to be developing over the next year. Um, so as a as a relationship, I think if we 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 keep in touch and and make sure things that are relevant to to your your members um uh, relate to yourselves okay good so we've heard from a member of the audience thanks uh if people want to ask questions you can use the q a function at the bottom of the zoom screen uh i'm not sure if you have reference to that yourself simon uh, rather than me reading it all out uh essentially da -da -da, uh and yeah, involved with that, the topics, yeah. uh, da -da -da. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you, I won't read it out, I'll let you uh, just work through that if you can yeah. and come back to Melissa on those points, that'd be great.
I guess at the end there, she's asking, you know, is there a size, is there a cutoff size of project that the environmental climate works role starts to become more prevalent or uh, in terms of the scale of, of projects that the the role is uh, used for? Yeah, there's a couple of points there. Um, I think they, they're not going to be a statutory consultee. Um, it's as as you've said, it's just a, a third party verification to respond or to to relate to a planning condition. Whether contractors and developers are going to pay for this, um, well, I don't imagine a contractor would pay for it necessarily. It's it's part of it to discharge the condition, um, and so it would be on the developer to to fund that role. Um, obviously, I'm not a planning expert, um, but the the well, hops and the the guidance that we've received um, from elsewhere, they feel pretty comfortable that this is a just planning condition. Um, and so, yeah, I guess we'll we'll need to wait and see as to whether there's any any kickback from that. But um, it would be a similar requirement to to any um, requirement to to satisfy the condition. In terms of there being a threshold on larger developments, um, again, within the the document, there is a threshold for, for when the LPA should assess as to whether there's a need for an environmental clerk of works. Um, and that, well, that threshold is is in there. Um, and again, that's, that's I suppose, um, being verified by, by HOPS. <clears throat> Yeah, in terms of the last point there, um, major applications, major projects usually get resource heavy. So a contractor can justify having someone like myself potentially on there the whole time. It's the smaller jobs which carry just as much risk environmentally, right. but, but fall through the loopholes because there's not the resource there. So this role could potentially fill that gap um, because, yeah, this, a project's risk is is not deemed on how big it is um in, in my in my opinion okay good thanks for that both melissa feel free to come back if you wish uh, hopefully that's given you the information that you're looking for um i think there's another open question that's come in as well uh is that right lorraine did you see another query that's come in from thomas oh, that only that one. Um, I'll just check the chat. Oh, that that was just a name clarification. Right. Okay. You have the same thing else. As, as I say, please feel free to uh, direct and queries to Dan or, or, or Simon. Have you left your uh, contact details? Uh, I didn't see them on any of the slides, but presumably we can pass those on to the people who've joined. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll add them to the presentation, Dan, if that's all right. Yeah. What's the project that you're working on down up in the Highlands? What's Strabag doing up there, if you don't mind me asking? Um, it's an exploratory tunnel for a pump storage scheme. So, okay. um, yeah, quite a sizable project. The school have come across Strabag with our work with HS2 is obviously a part of the uh, JVs on the major works. Yeah. 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 I'm just looking through the participant list to see if there's anybody else who would like to ask. Okay, uh, probably got to take that as a good thing in terms of clarity that there aren't any questions coming through over and above what we've seen already. Uh, so we'll look on that as, as in a positive way and uh, <clears throat> see it as the fact that you've given some good, clear uh, overviews of the latest guidelines and uh, practical applications of environmental clock of works in, in, in projects. So 
thanks once again to, to Simon and to Dan for joining. Um, we, as I said, have recorded this, so we'll send that round to everyone who's on the call, but also those who haven't made it. And Simon, let's pick up and develop the conversation and see what else we can do uh, to collaborate and um, increase awareness and recognition of the importance of the role going forwards across the UK. That'd be, I think, a really good thing for, for the school to do. In our team, we've got several members ourselves of IEMA, so there could be a connection there as well. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of this stuff, a lot of a lot of work is is developed in silos and that's potentially a challenge. Um so hopefully we can we all collaborate um, to move things move things forward. Great. Um uh, we as I think I said at the start of the call, uh but just to reiterate, we at the school had our final leadership group meeting of the year earlier this week. Uh, you'll see who the organisations are that guide and strategically lead our work on, on the website. If you look at the Scotland market pages on our website, you'll see some of the major contractors that the school is supporting and agencies such as Zero Waste Scotland and uh, research-based uh, organisations such as Built Environment Smart Transformation or BEST for short. Uh, that we also uh, have the pleasure of collaborating with uh, to push the transformation of the sector as a whole. So uh, feel free to engage with myself and Lorraine as well, anyone who wants to know more about upcoming training that the school is delivering in Scotland and resources that are available that we've developed over the years specific to the Scotland marketplace, but also to uh, particular issues around sustainability, such as that that we've uh, dealt with today. Thanks everyone for joining. I will give you 10 minutes back uh, for your day, which I'm sure you'll all appreciate. And we'll be in touch very soon and I uh, hope to take the conversation forward. Thanks again, Simon and Dan. Thanks, Andrew and Lorraine.